So as you are grabbing your seat, we have been in a series entitled Messy Church, going through the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Well, today we arrived at chapter 15. And chapter 15, according to many theologians, well, first of all, it is the longest chapter, is the longest chapter, the longest chapter in the letter. It's also considered the centerpiece of Christianity because of its core doctrine and teaching. In my hand this morning, I'm holding a football. And listen, it's not football season, but it's always appropriate. There is this old saying in the late 1960s, I believe it was 1967, the Green Bay Packers are absolutely blindsided and defeated by the Philadelphia Eagles. The next fall, as now the Green Bay Packers and Coach Vince Lombardi go back to training camp, go back to training, go back to preparing for the following season, the players are taken by surprise as Vince Lombardi stands in front of his players in the locker room and holds up a football. And he says, men, gentlemen, this is a football. What was Vince Lombardi saying? These professional athletes are taken by surprise. Because now, that summer, that training camp, they're learning the fundamentals. How to tackle, how to block, how to catch, how to throw, how to read a defense. It's all fundamentals. These professional football players had to be brought back to the basics. This is a football. By the way, Vince Lombardi and the Green Bay Packers would go and win five Super Bowls in seven years. And it all started with, this is a football. Sometimes we need to go back to the fundamentals. We need to go back to the basics. Church, this is a Bible. This is a Bible. It's God's word. This is the very heartbeat of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You will recall over the last couple of weeks, man, the Apostle Paul has been all over this gamut as he is addressing questions and issues that arose from that early church in Corinth. Apparently, one of those early issues was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let me explain. Culturally, that Greek culture had a real problem accepting a resurrection. So Paul, in chapter 15, takes time to address this issue and says, man, without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your faith is absolutely rubbish. It means nothing. There is a portion in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, where the apostle Paul goes to a place called Mars Hill, and he proclaims this verse here, verse 17, chapter 17, verse 32 in the book of Acts. I'll read it to you. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Later on, that's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says in verse 12, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And so Paul there is addressing this issue. Their context is they had an issue, they had a problem with someone resurrecting from the dead. If that makes sense this morning, look to your neighbor and say, that makes sense. Good, okay. So let's pick up. We're going to be in chapter 15 this morning, verse 1, as we jump into God's Word. If you're there already this morning, say word. Great, let's jump in with both feet. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. By the way, if you have our Bible, that's going to be on page 540. 540 on our, no, excuse me, 541. 541 in our Bible. Join us there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. Now, brothers and sisters, let's stop right there. Every single time we see this in the Bible, we always pause. Why? Because it's almost like that feeling in your heart where you say, Phew, I'm safe. What is Paul's heartbeat in saying this? Hey, brothers and sisters, hey, family, hey, people whom I love, whom I care for, family meeting. And I don't know about your family or your background and your family. Sometimes that family meeting can bring a lot of anxiety. It doesn't here, right? So here he's saying, brothers and sisters, he's bringing them together. What is he going to say? Verse 1, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. So with your pen, pencil, lipstick, mascara handy, Circle, highlight, underline gospel. If you treat your Bible like a textbook, circle, highlight, underline gospel. Right next to that, write good news. What is the gospel? Simply means good news. That also happens to be your first blank on your handout. So there you go. Gospel simply means good news. It is the good news of Jesus Christ. Here Paul is saying this. Hey, brother and sister. Hey, family member. Hey, individual whom I care for. Don't lose sight of this. Don't lose sight of the gospel. It's the good news. 
Now, here's the reality. When somebody were to tell you, hey, I got some good news and I have some bad news. If, I, if you're like me, I, man, I hate hearing that. I really do. I hate, it's one of those phrases I just cannot stand. I have some good news and I have some bad news. And usually you say, well, what's the bad news, right? Let's get that out of the way. Let me get punched in the face first before I take the good news, right? Let me get the jab in the gut before I get the ice cream sundae, right? So what's the bad news first? And here's the reality. According to Scripture, we are sinners separated from God, destined to hell for eternity. That's some bad news. That ain't some good news, folks. That's not something that gets us out of joy and says, yes, but that's a reality. Here's the good news. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Living 33 perfect years, living the life that you should have lived, dying the death that you deserved on the cross to now restore your relationship back to God in the first place. That's the whole idea of the good news. And listen, it almost sounds too good to be true because it is, right? It sounds incredible. It's true. You can bank on it. You can trust this gospel. Man, it is good news, good news, good news. Verse 2. Everybody look at verse 2. Let's read that together. By this gospel, you are saved. By this good news, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Your attention, please. There, Paul, the Apostle Paul saying, hey, by this good news, by this truth, you have been saved. And he's going to go on and say, otherwise, you have believed in vain. The Apostle Paul saying, of all the things we can talk about, we can talk about doctrine, theology, works, things, signs, wonders, tongues, spiritual gifts, miracles. Talk about whatever it is that you want. But the gospel is bedrock. It is central in everything. That's what Paul is reminding them and saying, hey, don't miss this point. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. I'll read this to you. Ephesians 2, verse 1. As for you. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work, and those who are disobedient. So write this down, your second point on your handout. What's the result of receiving the gospel? Write this down, salvation. It is for freedom, Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, that Christ set you free. What was the whole point? To save you. It is salvation. The whole point is that God loves you. That's it. Man, what about like the prophets and the doctrine, the Hebrew and the Greek? Don't overcomplicate it. Here's the basic. God loves you. God desires relationship with you. Fundamental. God not only loves you, God likes you. And how many of you know there's a difference? How many of you know you can love somebody but not necessarily like them, right? I see heads nodding, absolutely, right? God loves you. God likes you. He desires relationship with you. At the end of the day, God is for you, not against you. Don't leave this room without knowing that. Listen, many of you have been in church for decades. I have. And one of the things I have to constantly remind me every once in a while, that he's my heavenly father. Because you get so busy moving, doing, working, going, and we forget. We forget that almost like the Holy Spirit knocks on your heart and the Lord says, Roger, you know I love you, right? Yeah, I know, I know, Lord, I know. No, no, Roger, I love you and I like you and I desire a relationship with you. I want a fellowship with you. I want to spend time. I want you to abide in me. That's the whole point is to save us from what disaster calamity comes down the road. So let's put an analogy on this. Let's say you just decide one day I'm going to pick up surfing. But here's the problem. You're not a very strong swimmer, okay? So you're going to go over to Daytona Beach. You're going to be on your board. You're going to paddle. You're going to kick up. You're going to be riding a wave supposedly. And there, boom, you fall into the water. Here's the issue. You don't know how to swim. You can't save yourself. And three, four, five times if you're trying to reach the surface and you can't, you eventually come to the conclusion, I'm a goner. I'm going to drown. I'm not going to make it. Until a lifeguard comes and scoops you up by the arm, pulls you out and saves you. See, calamity destruction was coming, but somebody stepped in 
and now that destruction does not come anymore. You are now saved. That is you having a business and you have your accounts and the business dries up, the accounts don't come through, the money doesn't come through, you can't make the payroll, you can't pay yourself, let alone other people or keep the bills on. You're thinking, I'm about to lose the business, I'm about to lose everything. And then all of a sudden, a check comes in and it covers all your costs. It covers all the money that you owe. What happened? You were saved. Something bad was happening, but somebody stepped in and now what was going to happen that was bad no longer happens. Does that make sense this morning? That is what we call salvation. It is the very purpose of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 2, it's going to say this, by this gospel you are saved. That's in our translation and the original language, it reads different. In the original language it says, by this gospel you are being saved. That's what the original language says, which means you are constantly in this presence. There's a sanctification process that happens. You are declared guiltless. You are declared free in Christ. You are declared righteous in Christ. You now bear the image of Jesus as a son and daughter of God, as a Christ follower. And you are now moving forward in your journey. But that salvation never leaves and it never wears off. That's when you look to your neighbor and say amen. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So on your handout... Three parts of salvation. Right there in front of you, in front of you, you should say, you should see three parts of salvation. So write this down. Here's the past. Write this down. Justification. Justification. Now listen, let's be honest. Justification is an unnecessarily long word, almost like mayonnaise, right? But let's write this down. What does justification mean? Justification means, I've heard people say before, just as if I have never sinned. Justify, just as if I have never sinned. Romans chapter 5, verse 16. It's going to say this. Free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. See, here's the reality. Jesus, because of the power of the cross, the good news of the gospel, your past has been paid for, has been forgiven. Don't ever let the enemy throw your past in your face. The past is done. Amen? It's been paid for on the cross. You are, now a, uh, you are now an innocent, free man, free woman walking in the freedom of Jesus Christ. Years ago, Rachel and I had the privilege of leading a youth group in, uh, in, in Pompano Beach, Florida, in South Florida, in Broward County. We took a group of our kids to summer camp. And when you take a group to summer camp, I'll just be honest, your main objective is to make sure all the kids come back alive, to make sure you come back with all those kids and you just pray that, the, that heaven falls. You just pray that there's some kind of response, right? You just want to see some kind of movement in your youth group. We went, we took a, a group of 25, almost 30 kids to middle schoolers. Ah! Middle schoolers, I forgot to mention that. Middle schoolers to Deland, Florida, to Stetson University for a camp for a week. We loved it. Great time. In that week, we had a boy by the name of AJ. Let me explain. AJ was the boy my assistant told me, hey, Roger, AJ's father turned in a an application, a brochure for him to go to camp. And all of the leaders say, oh, it's AJ. And of course, that's the kid you want. By the way, he's the last kid to register. That very last kid to register, you know God has a special plan for. The one that like barely met the cutoff by like an hour, that's the kid, want, that's the kid that God wants to go to camp. So we go to camp, AJ's there, AJ does pretty well. Up until the middle of the week, we leave on Friday, this is like Wednesday night. And some, for some reason, his little middle school brain just went, okay, it just went sideways, it just, it just snapped. This happens with middle school boys, you just can't explain it, it just happens. And so his brain just kind of flips, right? And he just decides to make one bad decision after the other. One of the bad decisions he does, one of the boys is in the shower, and you know where I'm going with this. He embarrasses him. He tries to pull the curtain, pull him out of the shower. And of course, today, you, you don't play with that, right? Severe, severe consequence. As the leader, as the adult, you have no choice but to send this kid home. And so, of course, AJ realizes his dad was a strict disciplinarian. Please don't tell my dad. Please, buddy, I told them you tied my hands. There is nothing I can do. You have done this. You brought this, brought this upon yourself. So I had... Probably something I would never do again because I would fire somebody if they did this. Uh, I thought to myself as a youth pastor, I have this idea. This will preach. I banked on this. The boy that got pulled out of the shower, I looked at him and his name was Andrew. I said, Andrew, you're going to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner. You will decide what will happen to AJ. 
Do I send him home? Do I let him stay? Without even blinking, Andrew says, I don't want AJ to go home. I want him to stay. I forgive him. And I'm telling you, AJ fell to his knees, weeping. And all he could say was, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. He gives Andrew a giant hug. And the rest of the week, guess who's the first one to wake up? AJ. Who's the first one to go into sessions? AJ. That Thursday night, he gives his life to Jesus Christ. He surrenders his life to the Lord. He's kind to Andrew. Is it out of guilt? No. Is it out of shame? No. It's out of gratitude. It's out of gratitude for what was done for him. He was absolutely justified and forgiven. Folks, that is exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us. We are justified. So listen, when the enemy, when Satan tries to knock or whisper into your ear and to remind you of your past, the devil is a liar. Because Jesus already paid for that. Your past is already forgiven. You have been justified. Write this down as well. Your past as well as your present. Sanctification. Sanctification. So again, another unnecessarily long word. But sanctification means becoming more like Jesus. That's what that means. It's a process of you becoming more like Jesus. Don't miss the word process. 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 It's a process of you being more like Jesus. Romans 6, verse 19. And so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. That word members in Romans means your five senses. Touch, sight, sound, taste, hearing. It's your body surrendering, right? Being given over for the process of sanctification. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. I'm not going to lie to you. Sanctification is not fun. Because sometimes we learn things by reading, we learn things by a podcast, and sometimes we learn things the hard way. We have to learn it sometimes that way because we're human and we're stubborn. But the sanctification process is vital because that process makes us more like Jesus. Remember, God is not concerned about your comfort. God is concerned about your holiness. The purpose is you being more like Jesus. That's the whole point. That's Christianity 101, you being more like Jesus day by day, not on your own strength because you can't do it, but by the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit through your life, you become more like Jesus every single day. You guys remember the, uh, the Polaroid cameras? Man, I miss those. Those are great. And those of you that are not old enough, uh, I remember going to, I spoke at camp at Camp Gilead a couple weeks ago, told one of our counselors who I think is 19, 20 years old, and discussed to him the joys of going to a, a video store and renting a video and you have to rewind it or else you get fined. He's like, well, why would you rewind it? Because you get fined. But why would, you re- why would you rewind it? Because you get fined. They charge you. You have to rewind the tape. What do you mean you have to rewind it? You have to put it in your VCR, press rewind, or else they'll charge you money for it. And he looked at me like I was a caveman, like I was some kind of savage or a barbarian. He's thinking like, I have never heard of such a thing, right? So for some of you in the room who don't know what a Polo- Polaroid camera is, um, so nowadays you take a picture, it's instant, and usually it's in the cloud, and you can pull up a picture on your phone, on your tablet, your watch, your computer, wherever. But back then, you'd have to go process your film. You'd have to wait several hours, sometimes days. You take pictures, they make the pictures, you pick them up, you have them, and it ta- it's a process to do. But a Polaroid camera was different. You would take a picture, it comes out in the square, and if you remember, you get it. Is it ready? No. What do you got to do? You got to shake it like a Polaroid, right? You got to get it and shake it. The process is shaking it, and as you're shaking it, you have to shake it, and you wait on it, and then what happens? Your picture's clear. It's visible. Sanctification is a lot like that. You have to be shaken, and you have to wait. You have to be shaken, and you have to wait. What's the result? To make you more like Jesus. That's the result. It's sanctification. That's where God's kindness comes in. So it's our past justification. It's our present sanctification. Uh, And now let's go to the future. Write this down. Resurrection. Write that down, resurrection. So your past, your present, and your future. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 2. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. And so we see the action holding firm, holding firm. And the original King James Version, it's keep in memory. Keep in memory. 
Don't forget. And it's almost as if we have to be reminded of this, right? We have to be reminded of the future, of, of our future place and glory. John chapter 10, verse 28, listen to this. And I give eternal life to them. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. See, to ask the question, can I lose my salvation is kind of a silly question. Don't ask the question, can I lose my salvation? The question is, can Jesus lose a Christian? Ask that question. Can Jesus lose a Christian? Here's the answer. No, no, no. What does scripture say? <clears throat> Excuse me. I give eternal life to them. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. You belong to Jesus and your, your salvation is sealed in Christ. Amen. Everybody with me this morning so far? Good. Verse 3, let's move on. Verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as first importance. So let's stop there. What's Paul doing? Of all the things, this is most important. I need to remind you of this thing. What does he say? <clears throat> Excuse me. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Verse 4. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, Again, according to the scriptures. So in your Bible, you'll see the word Christ, Christ. Circle, highlight, underline Christ. Next to that, write anointed one, anointed one. Christ means anointed one. Write this down. You're blank on your handout. Christ means that Jesus is God. See, Jesus is the anointed one. He's the chosen one. He's the Mashiach. He's the Messiah. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's not like, hi, my name is Jesus Christ. Hey, Mr. Christ, good to meet you. Christ is his title, not his name. Does that make sense this morning? Christ is a title, not his name. So Jesus is the Christ, which means Jesus is the Son of God. Every Christmas season, we're going to come across this verse, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Go into Hobby Lobby, probably around October when all the Christmas stuff comes up. You'll see this verse on everything. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. I'll read it to you. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. What does it imply? Jesus was born. He was given to us of the Father. And the government will sit upon his shoulder. What does that mean? Jesus having authority and power. And his name will be called Wonderful. What does that mean? His personality. He's kind. He's compassionate. He's wonderful. But let's read on. Counselor. What does that mean? He's able to help. He's able to assist. He's able to come alongside. Let's read on. Mighty God. What does that mean? Jesus is God. And not only is he God, I like that word. And the book of Isaiah uses the word mighty. Mighty. He's mighty. Jesus is meek, not weak. Jesus is meek, not weak. He's meek, M-E-E-K. He's not weak, W-E-A-K, right? He's meek, not weak. He's gentle. He's mighty, but he's gentle. He's also everlasting father. He's prince of peace. So on your handout, write this down this morning. Christianity 101A, Christians believe that Jesus is God. Every other religion believes that Jesus is not God. That's Christianity 101A. Christians believe that Jesus is God. Every other religion believes that Jesus is not God. So here's what we're going to say. There can't be more than one truth. If we believe that God's word is true, that would make everything else what? False or not true. Correct? You can't be halfway pregnant. You either are or you're not. Right? Right? There's no such thing as two truths. There's no such thing as two truths. That's nonsensical, right? I don't care what culture tells you, that's a lie. There's a truth and there's untruth. So if we believe that scripture is true, we would believe that Jesus is God. Every other religion, every other form of faith believes that Jesus is not God, which means that it is not true, right, according to scripture. So this is very interesting. In our city alone, the Southern Baptist Convention in our city has some in our region has some, I believe it's like 96 or 97 churches. Just the Southern Baptist Convention. That's it. I mean, 96, 97 churches. That's insane. That's a lot of churches. We are a very reached area of the country. Now, let's go outside of those circles. Let's go outside of that tribe. 
You have Methodist churches. You have Presbyterian churches. We have our friends over at Victory. We have our friends over at Lakes Church. We have our, our, our friends over at Mount Tabor. We have our friends over at Revive. We have our friends over at Calvary Chapel. We have our friends in numerous different tribes in our city. And we're all on the same team. Why? Because we believe that Jesus is God. So let's say you're at home and you're going to see a nice fancy bike. And you're going to see a Mormon riding on that bike. They're going to knock on your door. You're going to open the door. You're going to have dialogue. You're going to ask the Mormon individual, who is Jesus? And they're going to say, well, Jesus isn't God. I mean, he's a son of God, but he's not the son of God. The Mormon will go and tell you, you see, because God has two sons, Jesus and Lucifer. So Jesus is not the son. He's not the Messiah. Yeah, he was crucified. He died, but he didn't really die for what we believe it to be. He did ascend into heaven. And guess what? If you live your life perfectly, one day you can rule your own universe like Thanos. That's what they would teach. That's what they would teach. Here's the problem. It's not truth. It's not scripture. The Jehovah's Witnesses also maybe on, it's a Saturday. They knock on the door. You're hiding behind your couch. You get out of your couch. You open up the door. Say, hello, my name is so-and-so. You ask the Jehovah's Witness, who is Jesus Christ? Is Jesus Christ God? They would say, oh, no, no, no. See, Jesus Christ was Michael the archangel who came down in the form of Jesus. He eventually just resurrected back, and now he's back into his form as Michael the archangel. Here's the problem with that. It's not truth. You're going to come across the unity school of Christianity. And that sounds good. Unity. Yeah, we're united. It's school. I mean, we're school, right? We're, we're in favor of schools. Uh, Christianity. Oh, that's safe. The unity school of Christianity. You're going to ask them, is Jesus God? No, no, Jesus is not God. In fact, we believe, they would say, the unity school of Christianity, we believe that a man came on planet earth. He lived several lives through reincarnation. He eventually got it right. He was Jesus. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So did he die for our sins on the cross? Oh, no, no, no. He didn't die for anybody. He eventually, because he became perfect, ascended into heaven and now is in heaven as Jesus. And if you are perfect through a series of reincarnation, that's you trying your life over and over and over until you get it right. When you arrive just right, you too can go into heaven. Here's the problem with that. It's not true. It's not true. Muslims, is Jesus God? No, no, but we respect Jesus. We have, a, we have a fond respect of Jesus. Jesus is mentioned in the Quran. They'll say, hey, he's in our scripture. Is Jesus God? No, no, he's a prophet. Muhammad is the true prophet of God, not Jesus. Did Jesus die on the cross? Oh, no, no. See, Jesus was crucified on the cross, but he didn't die. He passed out. And then as he passed out, he eventually just kind of ascended into heaven, into glory with the other prophets. What? Here's the reality. It's not true. Now, remember what we said last week. What is the truth? It's a scalpel, not a sword. Remember? It's a scalpel and not a two by four. Remember? So what do we do? That should break our heart for these people. It's winning these folks to Jesus, not beating them over the head with Jesus. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So as I tell you these things, your heart should break. There should be something in your heart that says, oh, it sounds like truth, but it's not truth. Ah, uh, it sounds so close, but it's wrong. Ah, uh, they're missing heaven by this much because it sounds right. But listen, as a Christian, this should break your heart. But also as a Christian, this should remember you. Because remember, Christians believe that Jesus is God. Every other religion believes that Jesus is not God. What would that mean? We don't shoot at our own tribe. We don't shoot at other tribes too. That would be like Florida going to war with Georgia and Texas or New York right? We don't shoot against our own people. We have friends in d different denominations. We have friends in different traditions. Some of them will believe that the gifts it continue. Some of them believe that they have ceased. Some have women pastors. Some do not have women pastors. Some are more complementarian. Some are more egalitarian. Some are more reformed. Some are more Arminian. Do you believe Jesus is God? Yes. You have the jersey. We're on the same team. Amen? Let's not be shooting at other people on our team. So that's important for us to remember. And Paul is bringing that to their attention. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. Let's read that one more time. Verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you 
as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So write this down. Very foundational. This means practically I am a sinner. That's what that means. I am a big fat sinner. That's what that means. The scripture would say, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Scripture will also say the wages of sin is death. The wages, the cost, the heaviness of sin equals death. It always does. When we disobey, there's consequence. When we disobey, there's action that happens that's not favorable. We believe to the very core that we're a sinner. Can I tell you, we were born sinners. You were never taught to disobey as a child. You kind of just figured that out on your own, right? I did. You were never taught, hey, here's what I need you to do, sweetheart. I need you to talk back to me. Can you talk back to me? Good job, sweetheart. I'm so proud. No, I didn't have to be taught that. I kind of figured that out on my own. When I tell you to do something, I need you to tell me no and stomp off. Can you do that for me, sweetheart? Great job. Listen, we do that on our own. Dogs bark, cats meow, people sin. It's our very sin nature. It's our sin nature. And the idea of the gospel is that we can't save ourselves. That's why we need a savior. Why? Because we're sinners. I've heard somebody explain it like this. Let's say we're going to pile up in the car. We're going to drive over to Daytona Beach. We'll probably stop off, stop off Bucky's first and get all the Bucky stuff. Then we're going to go to Daytona Beach and we're going to get in the ocean. And you and I are going to swim to the English Channel. Yeah, let's go. Now, a day later, 24 hours later, you might be 15, 20 miles ahead of me. And you're going to be 20 miles ahead of me and you're going to think, man, I'm doing way better than that Roger guy. Look how good I'm doing. But I'm not the standard. What's the standard? The English Channel. And here's the reality. You can't swim, swim to England. It's impossible. The standard is not an individual. The standard is the destination. Our standard is holiness. It's perfection and we can't reach it. We can never, ever, ever meet it, folks. Because then how do you know? Well, if I'm a good person, I can do that. But... How do you know if it's good enough? What do you just put it on a scale? Oh, man, I'm going to do good things after good thing after good thing after good thing after good thing. Here's what the book of James tells us. It's not about works that saves you. It's faith in Christ. We do the works not to get saved. We do the works because we are saved. It's the very byproduct of our salvation. It's the fruit of our salvation. So here's the reality. I'm a pretty good person. I mean, I've never done that before. Oh, really? Let, let's, go to the, let's go to the Ten Commandments. Have you ever told a lie? Ever, ever lied before? I mean, when I was a little kid, I mean, sure, I lied to my siblings. It's a lie, right? Have you ever stole anything in your life? Uh, have you ever coveted, wanted something that wasn't yours? Uh, have you ever committed murder? No. See, see, Roger, I got you on that one. See, I've never killed anybody before. That's never happened. Really? According to scripture, hating somebody is the same as murdering. Hating somebody is the same as killing somebody. Whoa, 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 pastor. Well, man, we're getting pretty deep, man. But at least I haven't committed adultery. Have you ever looked at a woman or a man lustfully in your own eye? You've already committed adultery in God's eyes. So if we stand before God, what does that make us? A liar? A thief? A uh, idolater, an adulterer, right? What are, we, what, are we, what are we before a holy God? Guilty. Guilty, no pun intended, guilty of sin. We're in big trouble. We're in big trouble. However, write this down. Christianity 101B, write this down. Christianity 101B. Christianity holds that Jesus paid for my sins. Every other religion holds that I pay for my sins. That's very important. Christianity 101b, Christianity holds that Jesus paid for my sins. Every other religion believes that I pay for my sins. So here's the reality. We stand before a just, righteous, holy God committing all of the sin. We're in trouble. But Jesus, what did Jesus do? See, Jesus lived 33 perfect years. He never sinned. He was sinless. So he lived the life you and I could never live. Here's the reality. Our sin separates us from God. That's hell for eternity. That breaks the heart of God. And when God said, listen, I'm going to make a way for you. I'm going to come down in the form of a man. 
I'm going to live the life that you should have lived. I'm going to die on your place for the cross because I love you and I desire a relationship with you. That's good news. That's the gospel. That is the very gospel in its core. Do you realize every religious structure apart from Christianity is about you getting to God? I got to do this. I got to starve myself. I got to harm myself. I need to meditate. I need to uh, seclude myself. I need to restrict myself. It's about me working to get to God. The scripture, the God of the Bible, is all about everything that God did to get to you. God did all the work. Amen? God does all the work. That's the reality. I'm going to do this. I'm going to fix myself. The idea is that we can't fix yourself. We, that's why we need a Savior in the first place. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the good news. Listen, this is more than coming to church for 45 minutes to an hour and a half. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's all about what Jesus has already done for you. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4, as we land the plane, the worship team's going to come up. Here's what the scripture's going to say. Verse 4, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, your attention, please. Why is this important? Remember the context that church in Corinth did not believe in a resurrection. They had a real issue with that. So if Paul is writing to a letter to our churches, to our culture today, you know what's crept into our culture? Oh, we're good people. What you believe is true is true. What you want to believe is true. If it's happy with you, if it's good with you, it's good with me. All roads lead to God. Paul would write to that in our culture. But in that culture, he's addressing if you will, the monkey in the room, the elephant in the room. He's addressing the issue. Verse 4, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve. If you're new to the Bible, Cephas is another word, another name for Peter. Peter. Every single time the disciples are listed in the Bible, Peter's always listed first. Tradition says, number one, because he's kind of like the authority over those guys. He's the leader. Number two, he's the oldest by a lot. So he's always mentioned first. Judas is always mentioned last. So what does it say? Jesus died. He was buried. He was put in a tomb. You know what that means? Jesus actually did die. Jesus actually was put in a tomb. The scripture would say there will be a gentleman by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, who had the money and the resources to buy and purchase that tomb for Jesus. Listen, don't feel bad for Joseph. Jesus won't use that tomb very long. Scripture would say three days later, Jesus pulls off Easter and raises from the dead. You serve and worship and follow a true, risen, living Savior. If Jesus Christ was still in the grave, folks, we are wasting our time. Do you realize that? Our, our belief system, our faith is is rubbish if Jesus had not raised, risen from the grave. But Jesus rose from the dead. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures that he appeared to Cephas, to Peter, and the other 12. Scripture's gonna say, Jesus, three days later, rose from the dead. He appears before the disciples in bodily form. Jesus will say, hey, cook up that fish. Let's make that breakfast. He begins to eat it. He's not like Casper the friendly ghost where he eats food and just falls through his body. He doesn't show up like Obi-Wan Kenobi. He doesn't show up like Anakin Skywalker as a forest ghost. He comes back in the flesh before the disciples. There's one guy, Thomas, who says, man, I don't believe it. Unless I see the marks on his hands. By the way, not hand here. Scripture would say in the original language in, in Greek and the Hebrew, the hand is from the tip of the middle finger to your forearm. This was considered the hand. He was not pierced from his hand. Of course, with his weight on the cross, it would have ripped off. He was pierced right on his wrist. Well, this is one of the strongest bones in your body. You see martial arts guys, they break ice, break blocks with this portion. So Jesus was crucified right under here. Thomas is saying this, unless I see the marks on his hand, unless I see the marks on his feet, I don't believe it. And Jesus, Scripture would say, would make his way, would appear before the disciples. And there Peter would say in a loud proclamation, my God, my Lord, you are God. And there Thomas, who's known as Doubting Thomas, knees hit the ground and says, you are the Lord. You are the living Christ. We worship and serve the living Christ. And here's the reality. All of the disciples from then on, a couple of days later, Jesus ascends into heaven. The church is birthed through the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. The very birth of the church happens at a prayer meeting. Unbelievable plan for the redemption of mankind. 
Do you realize 12 disciples, one of the disciples dies of natural causes. John, he's boiled alive. He's sent out to an island of Patmos and he dies by himself, lives up to his 90s and he eventually writes the book of Revelation. All of the other disciples, the 11 of the 12, all died as martyrs. They were, Peter was crucified upside down. Some were stoned, some were speared, some were beaten to death. 11 martyrs, some of those early church fathers also lost their lives for Jesus. That's what a martyr is, it's losing your life for Jesus Christ. You don't lose your life for a lie. I don't know about you, you don't live, you don't give up your life for something that's not true. This is absolutely true. They gave their lives for the gospel. And here's what I can tell you. This is good news. This is good news. Why? Because the very foundation of the faith, God loves you and he desires a relationship with you. He gave his son to die for you on the cross, to remove your sin, to establish a place for you in heaven and glory. Jesus is God. Everybody else would say Jesus is God not God, right? Jesus is alive. And here's what we know. Jesus is coming back soon. Coming back. The clock is ticking. We don't know the date. We don't know the time. But Jesus made it very clear. You'll kind of get the idea of the hour. And I believe we're in that hour. I believe we're in that fourth quarter. I believe that with all my heart. I can't put a date to it. That would be silly. Don't put a date. Be careful with that. But I can absolutely tell you, I believe with all my heart we're in the fourth quarter. Do you know that you know that you know that if you died today, you would be in heaven with the Lord? Do you know that you know that you know that you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Because here's the reality. The good news is a gift. It's good news, but it's also a gift given to you by God. The question is, do you believe it to be true in your own life and your own heart? So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I just want to give you this opportunity. I'm going to pray right now. I'm going to ask you to close your, close your eyes, to bow your heads right now as we close in prayer. And if you are here under the sound of my voice and you say, man, you know, I, I don't know. Roger, you were saying, if I know that I know that I know, I don't know. I don't know where I would be. I don't know what my, my future place will be. I don't know if I fully surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. I'm not sure if I really surrendered my life to him. Man, do it today. Do it today. I'm gonna ask you to do this. Pray with me right now in your head and in your heart. If you feel the Holy Spirit, if you feel this tug in your heart that says, yes, this is true, man, that is the Holy Spirit speaking to you today. Don't ignore it. Don't fight it. Don't refuse it. If you wanna pray to receive Christ today, I'm gonna ask you to pray with me right now in your head and in your heart and say, Father, forgive me of my sin. I know and I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. Right now, King Jesus, step out of heaven and come into my heart. Come into my life to be my God, my Savior, and my friend. I surrender my life to you today, King Jesus. My life is yours. I surrender it. I'm your disciple. In Jesus' name. Hey, listen, if you prayed that for the very first time, can you please let me know? A couple years back, I got invited to speak at a church in Orlando. Uh, they had two services. I was the guest speaker for the day. I was uh, pinch hitting for the pastor that was out of town. Hey, can you come preach for us? Man, I would love to. And I went, two services, and I preached it. It was a great time at that church. At the very conclusion, the very end of that first service, I opened up the altar similar to this. People came forward. They gave their lives to Jesus. It was great. In between services, there was a guy that came forward. And he said, Roger, I should have came forward and I didn't. And I said, no problem, bud. Hey, listen, if you want to pray, I'm going to pray to re- pray for you to receive Christ right now. Hey, pray for me. Pray with me right now. And he said, no, no, no. I don't want to do that. I want to wait for that opportunity to receive Christ when I'm called upon. So I'm going to sit in the second service. And I said, buddy, you don't have to do that. You're going to come and sit through my corny jokes twice in a row. It's going to be the same exact message. You don't have to do this. He said, no, no, no. I want to wait for that opportunity because I want to say yes. He stays for the second second service. And of course, Roger's corny jokes and all galore, right? So at the very end of that service, we open up the altar again and he comes down. And he surrenders his life to Jesus Christ. Listen, if it's not the first time, 
that's okay. Get it the second time. For many of you in this room, you've heard this time after time after time after time and you haven't surrendered your life. Man, today, I pray today would be the day of your salvation, man. Be set free. Listen, it's not about cleaning yourself up. Come to Jesus. He cleans you up. You can't clean yourself up. You come to Jesus. He cleans you up. Oh, but what about my past? It's okay. Past, present, and future has been forgiven. It's been forgotten. Scripture says Jesus throws your sin as far as the east is to the west. He doesn't remember it anymore. Some of you have heard this truth time and time and time again, man, today. Stop running. Stop stiff-arming God. So if you pray that for the first time, I'm going to step to the side. Worship team will be closing us in song. I'll come up to release us. But man, if you pray that for the first time, please come see us. I'll be by the double door at the end of the service. You'll see some other individuals with a red lanyard. Let them know as well. And we're going to congratulate you, answer questions for you, and resource you. We want to put resources in your hands. So do not leave today without doing that. Amen? Amen. Please stand as we worship the Lord together.